hopefully it will work this time and will stable itself out. So annoying. So very annoying. All right. So we are going to be reading Howl's Moving Castle by Diana Wayne Jones. So yes, this is originally where the story of Howl's Moving Castle came from. So, no, it was not an original story by um, Ghibli, or Ghibli, depending on who you ask on how to say it, because I've always heard Studio Ghibli, but I've recently heard people calling it Studio Ghibli. So, I guess Ghibli technically makes more sense. <laughs> Ghibli technically makes more sense. Alright. Chapter 1. In which Sophie walks to hats. In the land of Ingray, where such things as seven league boots and cloaks of invisibility really exist, it is quite a misfortune to be born the eldest of three. Everyone knows you are the one who will fail first and worse. If the three of you set out to seek your fortunes. Sophie Hatter was the eldest of three sisters. She was not even the child of a poor woodcutter, which might have given her some chance of success. Her parents were well to do and kept a lady's hat shop. in the prosperous town of Market Chipping. I'm sorry, I like, I end up moving my eyes ahead of before I finish reading the whole thing. Okay. True, her own mother died when Sophie was two years old and her sister Laddie, Letty, was one year older and their father married his youngest shop assistant, a pretty blonde girl called Franny. Franny shortly gave birth to the third sister, Martha, this ought to have made Sophie and Letty two ugly sisters. But in fact, all three girls grew up pretty indeed, though Letty was the one everyone said was the most beautiful. Franny treated all three girls with the same kindness and did, no, and did not favor Martha in the least. Mr. Howder was proud of his three daughters and sent them all to the best school in town. Sophie was the most studious. She read a great deal and very soon realized how little chance she had of an interesting future. It was a disappointment to her, but she was still happy enough after her to look after her sisters and grooming Martha to seek her fortune when the time came. Since Franny was always busy in the shop, Sophie was the one who looked after it after the younger two. Wow, I epically fail at reading. <laughs> There was a certain amount of screaming and hair pulling between the two younger sisters. Letty was by no means resigned to being the one who, next to Sophie, was bound to be the least successful. It's not fair, Letty would shout. Why should Martha have the best of it all? Just because she was born the youngest, I shall marry a prince, so there. To which Martha always retorted that she would be would end up distinguishedly rich without having to marry anybody. Then Sophie would have to drag them apart, mend their clothes, and mend their clothes. <laughs> she was very deft with her needle. Deft with her needle. Trina can't read. Trina can't read, guys. Fact. Trina can't read. <laughs> as time went on she made clothes for her sisters too 
There was one deep rose outfit she made for Letty the May day before the story really starts, which Franny said looked as if it had come from the most expensive shop in Kingsbury. About this time, everyone began talking of the Witch of the Waste. It was said that the witch had threatened the life of the king's daughter and that the king had commanded his personal magician, Wizard Solomon, to go into the waste and to deal with the witch. And it seemed that Wizard Solomon had not only failed to deal with the witch, he had got himself killed by her. So when a few months after that, a tall black castle suddenly appeared on the hills of Market Chipping, blowing clouds of black smoke from its four tall, thin truss turrets, everybody was fairly sure that the witch had moved out of the waste again and was about to terrorize the country the way she used to 50 years ago. People got very scared indeed. Nobody went out alone, particularly at night. What made it all the scarier was that the castle did not stay in the same place. Sometimes it was a tall black smudge on the moors to the northwest. Sometimes it reared above the rocks to the east and sometimes it came right downhill to sit in the heart only just beyond the last farm to the north. You could see it actually moving sometimes which smoke pouring out from the turrets in its dirty gray gusk. For a while, everyone was certain that the castle would come right down into the valley before long, and the mayor talked of sending to the king for help. But the castle stayed roving about the hills, and it was learned that it did not belong to the witch, but the wizard how. Wizard how was bad enough. <laughs> Though he did not seem to want to leave the hills, he was known to amuse himself by collecting young girls and sucking the souls from them. Or some people said that he ate their hearts. He was an utterly cold-blooded and heartless wizard, and no young girl was safe from him, if he caught her or her own. Sophie, Liddy, and Martha, along with all the other girls in Market Chipping, were warned to never go out alone which was a great annoyance to them. They won they wondered they wondered what use Wizard Howl found for all the souls he collected. They had other things on their minds before long, however, for Mr. Hatter died suddenly, just as Sophie was old enough to leave school for good. It appeared that Mr. Hatter had been altogether too proud of his daughters. The girls' school's fees he had been paying had left the shop with quite heavy debts. When the funeral was over, Franny sat down in the parlor in, in the house next door to the shop and explained the situation. You'll all have to leave that school, I'm afraid, she said. I've been doing some backs and fronts and sideways and the only way I can see to keep the business going and take care of the three of you is to see you all settled in promising apprenticeship somewhere. It isn't practical to have you all in the shop. I can't afford it. So this is what I've decided. Letty first. Letty looked up glowing with health and beauty which even sorrow and black clothes could not hide. I want to go on learning, she said. So you shall, love, said Franny. I have arranged for you to be an apprentice to Sari's, the pastry cook in the market square. They've, they have a name for treating their learners like kings and queens, and you should be very happy there, as well as learning a useful trade. Mrs. Mrs. I can't read this last name. Mrs. Sayari's a good customer and a good friend, and she's agreed to squeeze you in as a favor. Letty laughed in the way that showed that she was not at all pleased. Well, thank you, she said. Isn't it lucky that I liked cooking? 
Franny looked relieved. Letty was... Letty could be awkwardly strong-minded at times. Now, Martha, she said, I know you're full young to go out to work, so I thought round for something that would give you a long, quiet apprenticeship and go on being useful to you whatever you decide to do after that. You know my old school friend Annabelle Fairfax? Martha, who was slender and fair, fixed her big gray eyes on Franny, almost as strong-mindedly as Letty. You mean the one who talks such a lot? She said, isn't she a witch? Yes, with a lovely house and clients all over the Folding Valley. Franny said eagerly, she, she's a good woman, Martha. She'll teach you all she knows and very likely introduce you to grand people she knows in Kingsbury. You'll be all set up in life when she's done with you. She's a nice lady, Martha conceded. All right. Sophie, listening, felt that Franny had worked everything out just as it should be. Letty, as the second daughter, was never likely to come to much. So Franny had put her where she might meet a handsome young apprentice and live happily ever after. Martha, who was bound to strike out and make her fortune, was would have witchcraft and rich friends to help her. As for Sophie herself, Sophie had no doubt what was coming. It was not a surprise when her stepmother Franny said, Now Sophie, dear, it seems only right and just that you should inherit the hat shop. When I retire, being the eldest as you are, so I decided to take you on as an apprentice myself, to give you a chance to learn the trade. How do you feel about that? Sophie could hardly say that she simply felt resigned to the hat trade. She thanked Franny gratefully. So that's settled then, Franny said. The next day, Sophie helped Martha pack her clothes in a box. And the morning after that, they all saw her off on the carrier's cart, looking small and upright and nervous. For the way to the upper folding where Mrs. Fairfax lived laid over the hills past Wizard Howe's moving castle. Martha was understandably scared. She'll be all right, said Letty. Letty refused all help with packing. When the carrier's cart was out of sight, Letty crammed all of her possessions into a pillowcase and paid the neighbor's boot boy sixpence to wheel it in a wheelbarrow to Cesare's in Market Square. Letty marched behind the wheelbarrow, looking much more cheerful than Sophie expected. Indeed, she had the air of shaking the dust of the hat shop off her feet. The boot boy brought back a scribbled note from Letty, saying that she had put her things in the girl's dormitory and Cesare's seemed great fun. A week later, the carrier brought a letter from Martha to say that Martha had arrived safely and that Mrs. Fairfax was a great dear and uses honey with everything. She keeps bees. That was all Sophie heard of the sisters for quite a while because she started her own apprenticeship the day Martha and Letty left. Sophie, of course, knew that the hat trade was quite well already. Since she was a teeny child, she had run in the out of in and out of the big work shed across the yard where she had hats where the hats were damped and molded on blocks the flowers and fruit and other trimmings were made from wax and silk she knew the people who worked there most of them had been there when her father was a boy. She knew Bessie is the only remaining shop assistant. She knew the customers who bought the hats and the man who drove the cart, which fetched raw straws hats, raw straw hats in from the country to be shaped on blocks in the shed. 
She knew the other suppliers and how he made felt for winter hats. There was not really much that Franny could teach her, except perhaps the best way to get a customer to buy a hat. You uh, led up to the right hat, love, Franny said. Show them the ones that won't quite do first, so they know the difference as soon as they put the right one on. In fact, Sophie did not sell hats very much. After a day or so observing in the workshed and another day going around the clothier and the silk merchants with Franny, Franny set her to trimming hats. Sophie sat in a small alcove at the back, alcove at the back of the shop, sewing roses to bonnets and feeling to vorous. Goodness gracious. Lining all of them with silk and arranging wax fruit and ribbons stylishly on the outsides. She was good at it. She quite liked doing it. But she felt isolated and was a little dull. The workshop people were too old to be much fun. And besides, they treated her as somewhat a part who was going to inherit the business someday. Bessie treated her the same way. Bessie's only talk anyway was about the farmer she was going to marry the week after May Day. Sophie rather inv oh my gosh, so many of these words I don't know. Sophie rather invited Franny who could bustle off to bargain with the silk merchant however she wanted. The most interesting thing was the talk from the customers. Nobody can buy a hat without gossiping. Sophie sat in her alcove and stitched and heard that the mayor never would eat green vegetables and that Wizard Howl's castle had moved round to the cliffs again. Really, that man, whisper, whisper, whisper. The voices always dropped low when they talked of Wizard Howl, but Sophie gathered that he had caught a girl down the valley last month. Bluebeard, she said the whispers and then became voices again to say that Jane Farrier was a perfect disgrace that way she didn't the way she did her hair that was that was that was one who would never attract even wizard Hal, let alone a respectable man then there would be a fleeting, fearful whisper about the Witch of the Waste. Sophie began to feel that Wizard Howl and the Witch of the Waste should get together. <laughs> they seem to be made for one another. Someone ought to arrange a match, she remarked, to the hat she was trimming on the, at the moment. But by the end of the month, the gossip in the shop was suddenly about Letty's, was suddenly about Letty. Cesare's, it seemed, was packed with gentlemen from morning to night, each one buying quantities of cakes and demanding to be served by Letty. She had had ten proposals of marriage, ranging in quality from the mayor's son to the lad who swept the streets. And she had refused them all, saying she was too young to make up her mind yet. I call that sensible for her, so he said to the bonnet she was <laughs> she was pleading silk into. Franny was pleased with the news. I knew she'd be all right, she said happily. It occurred to Sophie that Franny was glad Letty was no longer around. Letty's bad for custom, she told the bonnet pleading away at the mushroom-colored silk. She would even she would even make you look glamorous, you dowdy old thing. Other ladies look at Letty and dis and despair. I thought it was in despair, but I guess it's and despair. Sophie talked to hats more and more as the weeks went by. There was no one else much to talk to. Franny was out bargaining or trying to whip up customer or trying to whip up custom 
much of the day and Bessie was busy serving and telling everyone her wedding plans. Sophie got into the habit of putting such putting each hat on its stand as she finished it. Where it had sat looking almost like a head without a body and pausing while she told the hat that the body under it ought to be like. She flattered the hats a bit because you should flatter customers. <laughs> this is silly. I love that this is all like prologue pretty much. You have a mystery you have a mysterious allure, she said to one of the hats. All was veiling with the hidden twinkles. To a wide, creamy hat with roses under the brim, she said, you are going to have to marry money. And to a caterpillar green straw with a curly green feather, she said, you are a young and springful leaf. You are as young as a spring leaf. Goodness gracious, Trina can't read. She told Pink Bonnets they had dimple charm and smart hats trimmed with velvet that they were witty tr that they were witty she told the mushroom bonnet the mushroom pleated bonnet you have a heart of gold and someone in a high position will see it and fall in love with you this was because she was sorry for that particular bonnet it looked so fussy and plain Jane Ferrier came into the shop the next day and bought it. Her hair did look a little strange, Sophie thought, peeping out of the alcove, as if Jane had wound it round of pokers. Round a row of pokers. Pokers are things for the fireplace, I believe. It seemed a pity that she had chosen that bonnet, but everyone seemed to be buying hats and bonnets around them. Maybe it was Fanny's sales talk, or maybe it was spring was coming on, but the hat trade was definitely picking up. Fanny began to say a little guiltily, I think I shouldn't have been in such a hurry to get Martha and Letty at placed out. At this rate, we might have managed. There was so much custom as April drew on toward May Day that Sophie had to put on a dermu gray dress and help in the shop too, but such was the demand that she was hard at trimming hats in between customers. And every evening she took them next door to the house where she worked by lamplight far into the night in order to have hats to sell the next day. Caterpillar green hats like the one the mayor's wife had were much called for and so were pink bonnets. Then the week before May Day, someone came in and asked for one of the mushroom pleated like the one Jane Ferrier had been wearing when she ran off with the Count of Cataract. Oh my. That night, as she sewed, Sophie admitted to herself that her life was rather dull. Instead of talking to the hats, she tried each one of the as she finished it and looked in the mirror. This was a mistake. Oh, the sound didn't work. That's not okay. But thank you for the follow. Thank you for the follows, cookies. I wonder why my sound didn't work. That's weird. Wait, what just happened? Oh, thank you for hosting Nightshade. <laughs> I don't know why my sounds aren't working for some reason. I uploaded custom sounds last night and they're not working. That's weird. Anyways. Where was I? Shoot. 
That night, as she sewed, Sophie admitted to herself that her life was rather dull. Instead of talking to the hat, she tried them on as she finished it and looked in the mirror. This was a mistake. The staid gray dress did not suit Sophie, particularly when her eyes were red-rimmed with sewing. And since her hair was a reddish straw color, neither did caterpillar green nor pink. The one with mushroom pleats simply made her look dreary. Like an old maid, said Sophie. Not that she wanted to race off with counts, like Jane Ferrier, or even fancied half the town offering her marriage, like Letty. But she wanted to do something she was not sure what. That had a bit more interest to it than simply making hats. Oh, turning hats. I was close. I was. I guessed what I was gonna say next. She thought she would find next time. She would find time next day to go to, and talk to Letty, but she did not go. Either she could not find the time, or she could not find the energy, or it seemed a great distance to Market Square, or she remembered that on her own. She was in danger from Wizard Howl. Anyway, every day it seemed more difficult to go and to see her sister. It was very odd. Sophie had always thought she was nearly as strong-minded as Letty. Now she was finding that there were some things she could not only do when there were no excuses left. This is absurd, Sophie said. Market Square is only two streets away. If I run... And she swore to herself that she would go round to. Sorry's when the hat shop was closed for May Day. Meanwhile, a new piece of gossip came into the shop. The king had quarreled with his own brother, Prince Justin. It was said that the prince had gone into exile. Nobody quite knew the reason for the quarrel. But the prince had actually come through market chipping in disguise a couple of months back, and nobody had known. The Count of Cataract had been sent by the king to look for the prince, when he happened to meet Jane Ferrier instead. Sophie listened and felt sad. Interesting things did seem to happen, but always to somebody else. Still, it would be nice to see Letty. Mayday came, merrymaking filled the streets from downward onward. From dawn onward. Gosh, down, I can't read. Franny went out already. But Sophie, Fanny went out already. I lost my place. Fanny went out early, but Sophie had a couple of hats to finish first. Sophie sang as she worked. After all, Letty was working too. Cesare's was open till midnight on holidays. I shall buy one of their cream cakes. Sophie decided. I haven't had one for ages. She watched people crowding past the window in all kinds of bright clothes. People selling souvenirs, people walking on, the, on stilts, and felt very excited. But when she at last put on the gray shawl over her gray dress and she went into the street, Sophie did not feel excited. She felt overwhelmed. There were too many people rushing past, laughing and shouting, far too much noise and jostling. Sophie felt as if the past month of sitting and sewing and turned her into an old woman or a semi-invalid. She gathered her shawl round her and crept along close to the houses, trying to avoid being trodden on by people's best shoes or being jabbed by elbows in trailing silk sleeves. When there came a sudden volley of bangs from overhead somewhere, Sophie thought she was going to faint. She looked up and saw Wizard Howl's castle right down on the hillside above the town, so near it seemed to be sitting on the chimneys. Blue flames were shooting out from all four of the castle's turrets, bringing balls of blue fire with them 
and exploding high in the sky quite horrendously. I don't know, that sounds pretty to me, but I mean, if you guys are afraid of him, I can understand. Wizard Howl seemed to be offended by Mayday, or maybe he was trying to join in in his own fashion. Sophie was too terrified to care. She would have gone home, except that she was halfway to say to Cesare's by then. So she ran. What made me think I wanted a life to be that was interesting? She asked as she ran. I'd be far too scared. It comes of the, being the eldest of three. When she reached Market Square, it was worse. If possible, most of the inns were in the square crowds of young men. Crowds of young men were swaggered beerily to the front trailing cloaks. Oh gosh, I cannot read. Fort trailing cloaks and long sleeves and stamping buckled shoes. There would never have dreamed of wearing on a working day. Calling loud remarks and oh, accusing girls. The girls strolled in fine par pairs, ready to be accosted. Oh gosh. Accosted? Oh. It was perfectly normal for Mayday, but Sophie was scared of that too. And when a young man is fantastical blue and silver costume spotted Sophie and decided to accost her as well. Sophie shrank into a shop doorway and tried to hide. The young man looked at her in surprise. It's all right, you little gray mouse. He said, laughing rather pitiful. pitiful. <laughs> Trina can't read. All right. rather pittingly. I only want to buy you a drink. Don't look so scared. The pitying look made Sophie utterly ashamed. She was, he was such a dashing specimen too. <laughs> With a boony sophisticated face. Bony sophisticated face. Learn how to read, Trina. Okay. Really quite old. Well, into his twenties. And elaborate blonde hair his sleeves trailed longer than any of in the square and galloped edges and silver inset in, in insets gosh darn i cannot read i'm almost, i think i'm almost done with this chapter right okay it's just a couple more pages i'll be okay i probably won't finish till like 10 30 though so <laughs> oh no thank you if you please sir sophie stammered I I'm on my way to see my sister. Then by all means do so. Laughed this. Nya, nya, nya. Advanced young man. Who am I to keep a pretty lady from her sister? Would you like me to go with you since you seem so scared? He meant it kindly, which made Sophie more ashamed than ever. No. No thank you, sir. She gasped and fled way past him. He wore perfume, too. The smell of Hyacinthins, I think. I don't know. Followed her as she ran. What a courtly person, Sophie thought. She, as she pushed her way between the little tables outside of Cesare's. The tables were packed inside and packed. The tables were packed. Inside was packed and all noisy as the square. Sophie located Letty among the line of assistants as the counter because at the counter because of the group of invaded farmers sons leaning their elbows on in to shout remarks to her. Letty, prettier than ever and perhaps a little thinner, was putting cakes into bags as fast as she could going as she could go gosh giving each bag a duff little twist and looking back under her own elbow with a smile and an answer for each bag she twisted 
There was a great deal of laughter. Sophie had to fight her way through to the counter. Letty saw her, and she looked shaken for a moment. Then her eyes and her smile widened, and she was, and she shouted, Sophie! Can I talk to you? Sophie yelled Som somewhere, she shouted a little helplessly as a large, well-dressed elbow jostled her back from the counter. Just a moment, Letty screamed back. She turned to the girl next to her and whispered. The girl nodded, grinned, and came to take Letty's place. You'll have to have me instead, she said to the crowd. Who's next? But I want to see, I want to talk to you, Letty, one of the farmer's yell, sons yelled. Talk to Carrie, Letty said. I want to talk to my sister. Nobody really seemed to mind. They jostled Sophie along to the end of the counter, where Letty helped up a flap and beckoned and told her not to keep Letty all day. Sophie had edged through the flap. Letty seized her wrist and dragged her into the back of the shop to a room surrounded by rack upon rack of wooden crates, each one yeah, come on, filled with rows of cakes. Letty pulled forward two stools. Sit down, she said. She looked in the near nearest rack it, in an empty absent-minded way and she handed sophie a cream cake out of it you may need this she said sophie sank into the stool breathing the rich smell of the cake in and feeling a little tearful oh letty she said i'm so glad to see you yes and i'm glad to see you're sitting down said letty you seem you see i'm not letty i'm martha <laughs> the I don't remember that happening in the movie. I know this is the book, so of course it's for... It would have been nice to have some context in that movie. And maybe it did happen and I just don't remember. Anyways, so there you go. That's chapter one of Howl's Moving Castle by Diane Wayne Jones. Oh, gosh, guys. All right. So how is everybody this morning? One, one. <sighs> Books are always better than the movie, right, Cookie? And not, not for everybody. So I know this sounds kind of weird, but movies are actually always easier for me than reading a book. I'm not very good at visualizing what happens in a book. <laughs> So movies are a lot helpful for me to actually see what's going on. I can understand though for some people why um, reading a book, if you have a better imagination, reading a book works out well. Alright, so what, let's see, what are, what do we have on the agenda? Because I know I'm already behind. I didn't realize it was going to take me almost an hour to read a chapter. I thought it was only going to take me 30 minutes. Um, but let's see what's on our agenda. I'm just going to put this as time sheet so I can find this. All right. me all right so it looks like we are supposed to be playing red dead redemption 2 until noon So that's what we are going to be doing next is playing some Red Dead. Am I playing actually Red Dead or am I playing Red Dead Online? I think I'm supposed to be playing the actual. Yes, I'm playing the actual Red Dead game. All right, guys. I know you guys love when I play Red Dead. So hopefully this will work out well. Um, mm, 
Ma. Wait, first I need to set things up real quick, which just means I gotta log into PlayStation Network. Um, I'm really sorry about my terrible reading skills. So here's the thing, when I was in school, I never read out loud, never. Um, the reason why is because I never ended up actually being in my class during my high school years. And before that, um, I was such a low reading skill level that teachers didn't make me read because it would take me too long to read it because I make a lot of mistakes, it's obvious as you guys just saw. <laughs> um, so I'm sorry that my reading out loud to you guys is kind of poor. Um, I wanted to do this and I'm going to keep trying to do it and try and work on my reading out loud skills because I know a lot of people want to hear this story, but I do apologize for all the mistakes that I will make as I'm reading the, as I'm reading these books to you guys. Oh. yes I did manage to do it I did manage I managed and I'm very I'm actually I know this sounds stupid but I am proud of myself for being able to do this and to be um to just like be I'm not used to the noise anymore because I always have my microphone plugged into my playstation now um Oh no, Red Dead is on, was updating. No wonder my stream has been so bad. It's probably been updating for a while. Okay, well, I don't think, is Red Dead, is Red Dead online even on my schedule today? Let's see. Looks like Monster Hunter World is what's on my schedule today for an online game. Yes, so I'm actually gonna go pause that update. Hopefully someone will remind me to start it back up again. Um, so today we will be playing Red Dead Online until noon. It's almost 1030 right now. Um, and then we will pl be playing Monster Hunter World with Rabbit Sensei Gaming. Um, because he agreed last night that he would like to play with me today. So play, play, play Monster Hunter World with me today. So that's what we're going to be doing. Um so hopefully he'll be awake soonish and we can do that um mm, i think that is about everything all right so we are going to continue our subathon um so i'm going to actually get rid of me get rid of my 3d me so one moment we're gonna do that and we're gonna get rid of this and we're gonna pull back up our rewards so last night we had gotten um to our 30 sub mark so i will be working on a stand-up routine which will be aired here on twitch get ready to hear a gunshot there we go. Okay. Um, so the next one um, is the next reward is at 35 subs. We only need four subs to get to there. Um, it's where I'm going to sing in an MMO of your guys' choosing with open mic. So I can either do it in Red Dead Redemption 2 online, Red Dead Online, I mean, or I can do it in Monster Hunter World, or I can do it in. Um, Elder Scrolls online and it's going to be up to you guys what you would like me to do. I'll do like a poll and stuff. Um, so at 40 subs I will be making my special heart attack cookies. Um, if you live in the United States and want to buy some heart attack cookies. Um, that's actually going to be something that you guys will be able to do is purchase heart attack cookies from me. Um, but they, they aren't going to be super cheap, to be honest, guys, because you got to ship them. <laughs> um, so don't, don't get too excited because <laughs> shipping usually is what gets people because it's usually like eight bucks for shipping. So, um, 
but that's going to be a reward. Heart attack. I'm going to make a cooking with Trina video with the heart attack cookies as well, so you guys can make them at home. Um, and then if we get to 45 subs, I'm going to kiss my best friend Starlight. Um, and at 50 subs, at 50 subs, it is going to be um, me playing Minecraft for eight hours. So at 50 subs, um, the Minecraft stream may take a little bit just because um, I will have to purchase Minecraft and I got to make sure that my funds will allow me to do that. So playing Minecraft for eight hours is going to kill me probably. Um, but yeah, beyond that, I don't have any idea of anything else to do for um, like rewards. I wasn't sure what to do for rewards beyond that. And I didn't want to make the reward goals so far apart that nobody could do them. Um, because I don't really have a huge following quite yet. I have, I think it says 117 now. Um, but like some people do them like for every 100 subs. And I'm like, I can't do that. So um, we got this. <laughs> Um, so we're going to start the Red Dead Redemption 2 part of the stream. If anybody doesn't remember, I play Red Dead Redemption 2, um, as Arthur Morgan. Uh, and right now we have just settled into a, um, new area on the map. And I had gone fishing, which was fun. And, <laughs> and I stole a boat. And there's a lot more stuff that happened that I can't really think of off the top of my head. Um, but hopefully all of this will go smoothly today. Hopefully everything will go smoothly today. Fingers crossed because we've already had an issue with the stream earlier. So, <laughs> all right guys.